Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the New York Stock Exchange. This is Dave Vellante, and you're watching the Cube and NYSC Wired's coverage of AI factories, data centers of the future. We're excited to have Dave Driggers here as the CEO and CTO of Cirascale. Dave, welcome. I love the title. It's like a little bit of Larry Ellison in there, CTO and hands-on operator. So, well, you're busy. Okay. Well, today, uh, with with how rapidly AI is changing and the and this techn tech technology market's moving, you kind of got to have two hats on right now. Yeah, I'll bet. Um, well, give us the update on on Cirascale. What's the lowdown? What's the business update? So we're we're a boutique cloud provider. What people have started to coin as a neo cloud. So as as everybody's seen from uh, from poor side from. Where we have, as well as Lambda, there's a lot of chatter out here around the uh, with the Neo Clouds, and we're right in the middle of it. We work with uh, both Nvidia and AMD, and uh, and it's it's a pretty crazy time right now. I love the fact that you use Neo Clouds as a as a term. A lot of a lot of Neo Cloud companies don't like the term. I love the term because Neo as in as in novel, and that's the way I see it. And Neo from the Matrix, um, like the <laughs> superpowers. Um, I want to focus on the global data center market. Um, and, and before I get into it, I, I mean, I'm looking at our numbers from the Cube Research. And Dave, this is just an amazing market. When you look at all data center spend, so power, cooling, storage, compute, um, networking, you know, it's been a perpetual $200 billion market for you know a long, long time. And then all of a sudden, in 2024, it exploded to like $350 billion and it's, it's growing at, you know, mid twenties um, and, and from a CAGR, you know, basis. And, and the, the AI portion of that is just taking over. It was probably less than 10% in 2020. And it's going to be 85% by the end of the decade. It's just, just an enormous transformation. So what are you seeing in terms of just the global market? Which regions are growing? What are you seeing in your business? Pretty much we're seeing it across the board. Now, because it is being driven primarily by AI slash technology, it's going to always start in the U.S. first, then it's going to be uh, into China, and then and then to Europe, and then, then after Europe, then Southeast Asia and, and India, Africa, et cetera. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So we're seeing what is the historical trend of how technology is being adopted. And you've had a couple of really big announcements recently from from uh, the Neo Clouds within Europe, uh, two big, big announcements there. And that's what we're expecting. I think you're within six months, you'll start seeing Southeast Asia have similar type of announcements as well. Dave, what's driving it? What does the next wave of applications and use cases look like? Some people, I know, I, you know, John Furrier and I talk all the time in the Cube Pod. He thinks the SaaS business is going to both get injected with intelligence and disrupted with intelligence. Uh, George Gilbert at the Cube Research uh, uses the term services as software, just like we had software as service. Now we're going to see a whole new set of productivity drivers coming through services as software. What are those sort of next waves of applications that you're seeing? Well, the ones we're already seeing pretty heavily with an enterprise is, is enterprises really, they've been doing, you know, POCs uh, around, around chatbots and chat GPT and uh, Gemini, as well as you, you name it, you see POCs. But most of those enterprises, ultimately, they want to have their own version of ChatGPT. You know, that one that's specific to them, that understands their business, but yet still provides the same type of almost a AI assistant or co-pilot, but one that's personalized. So, from a, let's put on your CTO hat for a minute and talk about architecture. Um, how does Sierra Scale think about uh, the right tool for the right job, horses for courses, as the Brits like to say, uh, for specific workloads. Are, are you sort of putting a general purpose infrastructure uh, that's optimized for AI uh, in, in front of customers? Are they? Uh, are you able to, to tune it for different jobs? How do you think about that from an architecture standpoint? Well, definitely, as, as, we're, as we're migrating from training being the primary driver for, for the growth of this technology and into the deployment of those models, it absolutely is a force for a force. All models uh, are, are not just if created equal. You've got small models, medium-sized models, large models, and gigantic models. With the previous wave with auto, the order of magnitude from a small AI model to a big AI model was within one order. You know, we had 
100 million parameters to 300 million parameters. With this Gen AI and LLMs, we see models that are a billion all the way to over a trillion. And the bigger the model, the bigger the hardware that needs to be utilized. The smaller the model, the only way to really drive the cost and the performance and scale is through smaller hardware. So lots of smaller hardware versus a one size fits everything. So it's definitely horses for courses. If a company's running a small model, it should be running on smaller hardware. And, and, and you're seeing, people like to say the shift from training to inference. I don't think it's necessarily a shift. I think it's just this more inference now. Um, and so when you think about that, I, I want to ask you about sort of the, the, the nuances there from a workload standpoint. Uh, let me start there, and then I have a follow-up question on the economics. So from a horses for courses standpoint, Talk to us about the training versus inference from an architectural standpoint. Uh, how, how do you approach that? For, for training, it, training that you've got your main job when you're trying to train a model is to get the model trained. It's all about time. How quickly can I move from concept to having a trained model? Mm -hmm. So we, we've got a very specific task there, which is go as fast as I can to train as big of a model as I can afford. That means we're going to build the biggest platform we can. Uh, simple as that. Whatever the budget will support, we want the biggest model. And we want that to be a consistent performance, a guarantee from beginning to end guarantee, which is why we use NVIDIA for those. It's an NVIDIA, you, you buy the latest NVIDIA GPU tied to the latest NVIDIA networking, you build a cluster, you train a model. That's not the case with inferencing. Inferencing, as I was saying, it's not a one size, it's not build the biggest thing I can. It now comes down to where I need to get this job done as as low cost as I can, as long as it meets my time requirement. So if it's a if it's a chat bot, it's it's low latency. So I've got to hit that latency. I've got to hit that time to answer. But now that it's doing work for me, it's how cheaply can I get that work done? Because if I replace a worker and it costs me 10 times as much to automate it, that's a failure. So cost really matters when we're talking about inference. Yeah, it makes sense. You've got your training. You're going to do a YOLO training run. The whole team's excited. They do, they do the training run. They hope it runs end to end and they get as much utilization as possible and it gets them the results they need. Um, inference is a whole different animal. So from an economic standpoint, I mean, the funding model in, in the neo cloud space seems to be uh, that you, you, know, you put out the CapEx, you've got to get to monetization uh, before the asset is depreciated. And then at the end of it, um, you know, there are sort of I interesting financial models where, uh, you know, you can you basically own the asset at the end of whatever, four or five years, and hope it's worth something. But if it's even if it's not worth something, if you can monetize it, that's okay. How do you guys approach that? Does today's, you know, training infrastructure become tomorrow's inference infrastructure? Is that not the case? Is this moving too fast? You what about that monetization? To, yeah, because the training... Uh, I can tell you, if a customer comes to me for training today, they have no interest in the previous generation. They right. want the latest and greatest, fastest thing they can get because their goal is to get that model trained as fast as possible, which means they either need a bigger cluster or they need a faster cluster or a bigger and faster cluster. Mm -hmm. So training people are always looking for the latest and greatest. Now, our goal to be able to, uh, which means that platform only lives 12 to 18 months because that's the cadence that, uh, NVIDIA is setting for next generation technology. So it's super exciting for 12 to 18 months for training, and then it starts tailing quickly. As a, as a cloud provider, our goal and our requirement is we have to be able to repurpose that equipment into inferencing, which it, it, it's the second life, it's the long tail for that equipment is inferencing. It may not be ideal for inferencing when it first launches, but once it gets depreciated and in its second life, our main thing we deal with it is repurpose it towards inferencing. So everybody talks about power as the constraints, you know, tokens per watt uh, is the new KPI. I, I, I coined a piece uh, called the new Jensen's law, uh, uh, buy more, uh, make more, or buy more, save more. Buy more, save more. Right, <laughs> right, both, both ends of that equation. And then there's a corollary on uh, you know, in video we say network is, is, is free. If your utilization is low, I guess it's economically neutral. Um, and there's, there's real math behind that. I think it's, it's legit. If, if power is the constraint, then that law actually holds. 
Uh, and if your utilization and of, everything changes as you start to move to inferencing. Yeah. So I want to I, I want to ask you about that. So so does the new Jensen's law hold? It sounds like it does in training. It changes an interesting double click on that and explain the nuance, David. So when, it, when we're talking about uh, training, power is not powers are big constraint because we need a lot of it to train a big cluster. But it's actually not our big cost. It's a it's a it's a forcing function that we've got to have a big data center. It's what's driving so much of this new data center growth is building up these training facilities. But power is not our big cost. It's depreciation of the hardware, depreciation of the hardware, depreciation of the hardware. That's where all of our biggest cost is when it comes to training. That flips on its head with inferencing. With inferencing, especially in real time, those those activities are going to need to occur closer and closer to the edge. And frankly, the cost of operations is a bigger part of our business. Whereas training, cost of operations, we can optimize it by putting those training systems in places where environments are tax free, where power is low cost, where things are readily available. I don't have the option with inferencing. With inferencing, if it's real time, I got to be where the people are. You know, think NFL cities. I've got to have compute there. Power is expensive. Power is scarce. Uh, I've got tax issues to deal with. And then more importantly, I'm, I shift a lot towards networking. This is where the networking becomes important because I'm moving data to and from users and to and from companies. With training, I may have one person running a thousand GPUs by themselves. Uh, the network get, the network gets cut and nobody even notices it. When it's inferencing, every that network is mission critical. Totally different animal. I wonder if you could give us a CTO's perspective um, on the network. You know, you hear companies like NVIDIA talk about uh, scale up, scale out, scale across. Uh, you you hear the the debate with Ethernet. Uh, versus InfiniBand, and they're both obviously winning in the market. Uh, from your perspective, talk about the importance of networking uh, and the sort of a horses for courses discussion again, and and what about that sort of in, InfiniBand and Ethernet? Is it a, a yes, both? Is it a one or the other? Is it a horses for courses? Please elaborate. Yeah, InfiniBand, without question, when you're talking training, InfiniBand's the king. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's... You're trying to build a big cluster. You're trying to turn all these machines into one single big machine for training. And that's where InfiniBand really excels, uh, especially when you're, you've got the whole software stack from NVIDIA. So you're coupling the GPU plus the InfiniBand plus the network switching, which is also all NVIDIA, all NVIDIA Slack Millilux. So there's, there's a reason why we do it there. We don't use InfiniBand in inferencing. Inferencing is all about Ethernet. It's all about the internet. It's all about connecting to users from one data center to another, and that's all Ethernet. So when we when we start talking about uh, uh, inferencing, it's all it's all Ethernet. Do you see? You know, Jensen talks about AI in the cloud, AI in enterprise, AI in robotics. AI in the cloud, get that. AI in robotics. There's your your classic edge case. How do you see AI in the enterprise playing out? Uh, the neo clouds obviously play a key role there. Uh, will enterprises actually build their own big AI clusters in your in your view? Will solutions evolve like the you know AI factories that Nvidia and companies like Dell talk about? How do you see that playing out? It's going to be tough for enterprises um, to do this by themselves. With if it's a again if it's a real time application, you have to build a peak. You have to build to when your business is actually running. If it's if it's something as simple as answering your phone and your phone is supposed to ring from nine to nine, you have to build to that peak. And that's not efficient because the rest of the time that compute is not going to be used. So it looks an awful lot like when enterprises first went to cloud, when you had these servers that were underutilized and you could go to AWS and pay a lot less because and even though AWS was making money on you, but you were using the server only for what you needed it for. This is a little bit more challenging because unlike traditional enterprise applications, these are real time and real time makes it harder to, to know how much capacity you need by accident. I mean, it, your real time goes up and down based upon when the users are using it. So it's a classic cloud, except it's not. 
So, um, so there's going to be some real challenges there for enterprises to adopt inferencing. They don't want to do it on-prem. They're too much wasted at infrastructure. It's harder to do versus traditional cloud because it is real time. So we've got to, we've got to have this ability to turn up and turn down and turn up and turn down resources. So it's, we're going to have cloud's going to have to evolve to be able to solve this problem. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, last question is kind of is related to what's in the future for, for Cirrus scale, your objectives for the company. We're here, of course, on wall street article in the wall street journal today, wall street's not doing their typical banker layoffs for the fall because they need the capacity to do M and a, to do IPOs and the market's heating up, uh, IPO in your future. What, where, where do you want to take the company? Oh, well, we're definitely going to do, we'll definitely wind up doing some type of a financing. The, uh, in order to keep up with the growth of the market, you know, you can only self fund four to five X per year, so many years in a row. It's uh, so we'll have to do a funding of some type, just like all the other successful Neo clouds, they have to wind up doing the funding because if you want to participate, the market's growing that fast. Well, how closely, I mean, I'm sure you look at the IPO market. I mean, I was here last December uh, in November talking to potential IPO candidates. They're like, yeah, you know, probably first half. I don't think so. Second half probably heats up. Maybe it's 2026 thing. It seems like that's been somewhat pulled forward. How, how much attention do you pay to that? Or is it more a case of, hey, when we're ready, you know, we'll talk to you? We're definitely, we're definitely of the type that when we're ready, we'll be ready. But we do see 2026 as a major breakout for enterprises moving into, into AI. And so we think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for the, for the neo clouds that are focused on enterprise and really have a differentiated enterprise solution. There's going to be a lot of opportunity to, to, to get out in 2026. Yeah. And then it's just the beginning, isn't it? I mean, the, the future yeah. is, is bright. We are, as they say, in the early innings. Uh, and it's just mind boggling when you think about uh, the types of, of, of in, innovation that companies like yours are enabling. So Dave, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE and NYSE Wired. Well, thank you. You bet, and thank you for watching AI Factories, Data Centers of the Futures. This is Dave Vellante for John Furrier, entire CUBE team. Keep it right there, we'll be right back, right after this short break.